This is the art of start-up war. And my name is Brian McMahon, your host and sensei. Here is what we know. 98% of startups will fail every single day. And mostly due to reasons outside your control. The Expert Dojo Startup Accelerator, we look to even up the playing field by sitting down with the greatest minds in startup investment right here in our studio in Silicon Beach, where we look to shine a light on your path to success. Now, our guests each week have invested millions of dollars into startups and are the most respected investors in the world. Now, they share all they know with you, the listener. So join us on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, starting off your week winning the war against start up failure. Okay, it's another week. It's the Art of Startup War. You got Brian back here again. I have my very good friend Daniel here from Fox Rothschild. And today, as always, on every Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we are going to talk about how the heck does an early stage startup entrepreneur raise investment for the damn business? Daniel, welcome. It's great to be here. It's so listen, to- mate, Fox Rothschild, huge, huge name in the attorney space, not just in LA, but around the United States. Can we start there, maybe talk a little bit about the company, where it came from, and how you managed to get so ingrained in this early stage startup venture space? Sure. I'd love to tell you about Fox Rothschild. We're an AmLaw 100 uh, corporate law firm with 800 attorneys and 21 offices around the country. Now, that might sound intimidating, but uh, each office is uh, focused on providing uh, 360 legal services for primarily middle market companies and startup companies. We also, we also obviously have Fortune 500 companies, but our primarily our DNA is working with uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, helping them get their company off the ground, helping them, their company get financing, helping them grow, and ultimately... Uh, hopefully uh, either going public or sell- selling to an acquirer. That's the dream, right? Just having That's a couple a of dollars in the bank where you're not crying and scraping <laughs> <laughs> and hoping that somebody would just rock you to sleep at night <laughs> while you worry about how you're going to make a payroll tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and look, as everybody in this podcast knows, finding investment is not a straight line. And that is why when we do these interviews, we interview everybody who can be a massive influencer in you getting to that stage and also being able to give you the advice to get there. So you're going to find that as you're looking for investment, it can be an angel that you get it from. It could be an early stage venture firm you get it from. It could be a credit card. God forbid. It wouldn't be the first time I've done a credit card to get through a month or so. Uh, it could be you know, a, an influencer in the industry. And most definitely, and, and this is what I saw more and more when I arrived in Los Angeles. And I don't know, Daniel, if it's specific to here or other places as well. The venture attorneys are so dialed into the space that it's almost when a startup comes in or when a company comes in to retain you, they don't just want your legal advice, although that is first and foremost. They also want your venture Rolodex and your advice as to who they should speak with on the venture side too, right? Absolutely. I mean, we provide, you know, legal services, but our primary, I, I see my primary role as a business advisor, as a, a as a person that can, you know, guide them through um, the fundraising process. That's probably the number one reason uh, people first engage us because they, they need to uh, talk to a potential investor about a term sheet. And, and to position themselves for investment. So, I mean, tried, I try to steer them in the right way and just help them avoid pitfalls and, and, and um, you know, just silly or stupid terms that, that some investors may, may throw at them and just give them a sense of what's out there, what's normal, what's standard, and kind of give them. But primarily, like you said, most investors, most companies are looking for potential investors. No, mate, I like this. Let's stick on this for a second because it's very true. As entrepreneurs, we come out with all guns blazing. We want to change the world. We want to disrupt an industry. We want to have something new. We have no idea about legal. Now, on the other side of the table, the person who's giving investment, let's assume they've given investment before, as the vast majority of them have, so they understand legal extremely well. 
what are some of those pitfalls that we should be careful of right at the very beginning when we're negotiating these term sheets, whether we're talking about board seats or whether we're talking about options or anything else? Just hit me with some of the big ones that for all of our entrepreneurs who've got their pens and paper out right now, they're writing down and saying, watch out for. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, uh, when we're talking about investment, number one thing is is valuation, just giving them a sense. Sometimes uh, you may get an investor that's very hard for your company, w- may give you a, a large or promise a large uh, figure of the, of the initial investment, but then might just throw out just to test you. I want 49% of the company. Something really just off base and, and kind of get, telling you, you're in control, you have 51%. That is way off market. Something like that. Some, sometimes just these terms that they throw out for the first time entrepreneurs, just a test sort of what, how you see your business and how, how, how desperate you are for the money that you would give away that much of your company. And it's a great point because, look, if on seed stage you're giving away 40, 50% of your company or pre-seed stage, it's game over. It's all right at that minute. The second you raise that money, your company has just crashed. And I'll tell you why. And I'd love to have a conversation about this. You're going to be probably go through, if you're a successful company, whether it's an Uber or a Lyft or any Dropbox or any of the companies that have made it through to later stage, you're going to have to go through four rounds, more than likely. You're going to have to go through pre-seed, which may be your mom or your dad or an early stage angel or friends or people who believe in you. You're going to have to go through seed, which is a later stage angel, normally up to about 1.5 million, right? maybe 1.5 to 3 if you're in San Francisco. Might be an angel, might be an early stage VC, maybe somebody who's just in the space, maybe a foreign investor. Then you're going to go through Series A. That might be anywhere from 10 12, 15 million, all the way up to 20, 30. I've even seen a $40 million valuation at Sirius A. And then you have to go to Sirius B, where again, the valuation may increase by 10 times. Uh, And then we have to go to Sirius C and D, right? So if you imagine right at the beginning that you give away 30, 40% of your business, well, use debt. Because you've got nothing left, right, Daniel? By the time you get to Sirius, uh, to C, Sirius A, Sirius B, you're going to be cut down more and more, and everybody's shares are going to dilute. So you'd be lucky if you have more than 5 6 7% in your company by sure. the end. And also, the, your, your, um, your other investors that come in later, when they see that you've given away that much to that initial investor, they're going to squeeze you even more. Yeah, and they're just going to know you're a schmuck. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. So you got to be careful. And by the way, look, so this is so easy for us to say in a podcast, right? As we're saying here and we're not involved in it. Like, I, I know, I feel it every day because we have investors coming through here, just how tough it is. If you don't take the money, you're going to lose everything. Like your company's gone because you don't have a plan B. You're in that space. You need that money within a month or a week or a day or an hour. And if you don't get it, it's all over. If you do take the money and you take it at that valuation, then you're going to be dead in six, 12 months time. So, I mean, my advice, and I don't know, this is not really a a legal side. I think this is just more of a a common sense side. I normally sit down with with our entrepreneurs and help them educate the investor to the futility of actually trying to take too much in the business. Sure. So that they can realize that the only thing that's going to happen is in 6, 12, 18 months' time, that entrepreneur is no longer going to want to run that business. Sure. You, as an entrepreneur, you want to set a roadmap of working with this initial investor long term. So if he doesn't see the roadmap and he's just seeing his bottom line, that's not a partner you want. Great so th- point. And uh, uh, once you set those expectations, he'll respect you, th- the fact that you have uh, this, gr- this grand vision and you know what's coming ahead. And you don't, you don't, don't, you don't want him to be a roadblock for further investment, or his his investment dies too with you. So why 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 do that? Because they see it short term, right? Especially a lot of these investors that are novice investors. They come in either as real estate investors, or maybe they were in the entertainment space, or maybe they made a bunch of money somewhere, and they think the same as you would in real estate. Well, if I have forty percent, it's better than thirty five, and thirty five is better than thirty. So I love what Daniel said there. Create a roadmap for your investor. At the beginning, when you're negotiating with an, with an investor, it is a negotiation of adversities. So you've got the investor who wants the best deal and you've got the best deal. But if you lay out the roadmap to what a two, three, four, five hundred million dollar company looks like, and you show the investor that actually the better roadmap for that investor is to make sure that the company is liquid and the company is able to actually go forward strongly with you at 
at the helm, then the investor will see the benefits of a 30% stake as opposed to a 50% stake. Absolutely. Sure. Cool. What else? I love this, actually. We're gonna, let's try and hit some of the big ones. What about sure. board seats? Yeah. The other thing that's important is not just valuation, is control, right? Yeah. How much the investor wants. So at the pre-seed level, you, you want to maintain, as a company, maximum flexibility. So you want to, the best you can, keep that investor off of the board of directors. Typically, the board of directors really is 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 the is the group that controls the company. It's not yeah. the CEO. The board the board actually legally hires the CEO, can fire the CEO. Now, obviously, if you're a founder, you wear many hats. One of them is the CEO, but you also wear, wear the hat of a board director. Now, if you allow um, an, oh, a, a single investor to join the board with you, you're just each of you have one essentially one vote on the board. Yeah. And that person, is, the investor, essentially has a veto right on all your decisions. Everything, right? Yeah, Everything that, major that you do. Yeah. So be so careful. Like, So two board seats, one you, one the investor, no. That's a recipe for disaster because then you guys can be deadlocked and then he basically holds a veto uh, right over all your decisions. That's too much, generally, given the market, too much uh, power to give to your initial investor and your your later uh, institutional investor, VC investors generally don't like to see that. Now, if the how do you avoid it though? Like I'm the investor, I'm saying, listen, dude, I'm putting thirty percent into your friggin' business. It's a million dollars. I want a board seat. If if they insist on a board seat, then you say, well, we'll create three board seats. You, uh, oh, one for one good. for the investor. Or you can say... Or maybe four or five board seats, right? Yeah, but we're going to create yeah, more, more so that the investor has got less control of Majority, the company. Yeah. I think the first thing, you before you even give them boards, you say, I'll give you a board observer seat. Perhaps like you who have access to all the information about the company. Um, that usually makes more sense if you have like a co-founder. So there's two of you. And whenever you have a meeting, you, you say, every time I have a meeting, a board meeting, I invite you to come. You don't have a vote on the board, but you see everything. Yeah. Now, if you insist on having a board seat, I want to vote, I want to be very involved, then you say, okay, you can have one seat out of three, out of five. Usually it's three, so you have a co-founder. If you don't have a co-founder, you 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 either have, have we have to legally figure a way out where you, you control those two seats, right? You just want to be in a position where you control, still control the direction of the company because as you raise additional funding, series seed, A, B, C, all of those investors, essentially there's an inflection point where there will be more board um, seats allocated to your investors than to the founders. And that's yeah. when they actually have control over the board. They have control over you. And this is, how, this is how Travis from Uber got fired off his own out of his own company, right? Eventually, because, yeah, because the, the number of people on the board, uh, they'll keep you on so for as long as you're doing well. But if things ever go south, they have the right to pull the plug. Yeah, or Steve Jobs. I mean, for everybody who's watched the movie, we can all see how you believe that as a CEO of your company, you run your company. No, you don't. The board run your company. company. You are merely an employee of the board. Bizarre, right? Because as a founder, it was supposed to be your damn company. But these rules change yeah. as it's, it grows, right? So you, it's every, every, uh, every time you get funding, it's a negotiation over how many board seats and who has control of the board. So you have to weigh very carefully. If I want that twenty million dollar investment, right? Do we? Am I comfortable with a board that's evenly split that could be deadlocked? Or when am I comfortable with a board that has three investor and then two co-founders? And so really, they they control it. I mean, so ladies and gentlemen, you are making a decision. The moment you take investment, you are making a decision. That decision is that the control, the 100% control that you used to have in your company is now gone. And not just gone for a little bit, it is gone forever. You are, and I don't want to say this badly because it's kind of, it's not an employee, employee that you work for people, but you are an employee of the board. And look, the upside is you can have a company worth a couple of hundred million dollars, which can sell out, you can make a lot of money, you can be in great shape. But the downside is, you are definitely beholden to people. And you need to be really careful, both legally and from a common sense perspective, that these people can't push you out of your own company at the start. Sure. So uh, obviously the only way to fight this and, and, and uh, delay that decision to give an investor group control of your board is your leverage. And you build that leverage through the success, success of your company, 
uh, your your uh, ability to to get other interested investors to create uh, a scenario where they're competing for your company so that you can demand these terms and and have investors be willing to give you those sums of money but not have you know, this ultimate control of your company. I like that. Okay, so now we've hit two really important points. Let's stick on this. I'm going to go off script here because this stuff is so important for startups to know. What's next? So we got board seats we have covered and we've got making sure the valuation is right. What's the next biggest thing you see from a, a mistake that startups make when they're negotiating on their investment? Yeah, then, there, then the devil is in the details because uh, investors will condition their investment on certain, if they can't have ultimate control, they will, they will define a small universe of decisions that regardless of their, of their minority position in your company, if you want to do these X, Y, and Z things, you have to get their approval. And so that needs to be recognized and discussed. For example, if you ever wanted to raise more money, yeah. you have to get their approval. These are the big buckets. If you want to sell your company, you have to get their approval. And I've seen this before. I've seen, I actually had a buddy and it, just, it makes me cringe now just even as I think of it. And he had an offer of about $80 million to buy his business. The investor felt that the business could grow to about five, six, seven hundred million dollars $700 vetoed the decision. The founder really wanted to sell. The business, of course, went bust. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, so he probably Sucks. didn't know that he gave away that Right. He didn't Some, check it. Sometimes sometimes they're not even aware of, of the of the, these important terms that, that need to be either negotiated or to be aware. Like say if someone says, Hey, you have to come to me for approval to sell the company, right? And what's the compromise? Maybe, okay, I have to come get your approval, but if the value of the deal is over forty million, I don't have to. Something that gives you a little bit more Say you give them a little bit of power, like sure, I I won't sell the company for less than this amount. But if it's if it reaches some sort of baseline, some threshold, then then I I, I have a right to to you know sell the company. I understand. Okay, lovely. And then what else? So I like that. What else have you seen from a from a company perspective that has just killed them that they agreed to in terms? Um, uh, the the other thing is uh, the other rights that an investor. You know, it's just day to day things like even like if you're able to uh, get a loan from a company. I mean, they just have they they just list out all the different things that you need their approval for. So you're just negotiating what the thresholds are, right? So um, if you need to get you know do, if you're strapped for cash and you can't raise another equity round, can you raise you know do do a f small financing through convertible notes with or without that investor? It's just yeah. giving you maximum flexibility to keep the company alive. So that you you don't feel like oh I'm I'm stuck, and I need the investor's approval. Oh, then they may come back and say oh, I'll put more money in your company, but at very favorable terms to the investor. Yeah, you mentioned convertible notes. How, how do you how do you feel the trends are going with regards to what investors are looking for? It used to be equity. Then we went through a long phase that convertible notes seemed to be the nice agreement between investors and, and people who were looking to raise money. Um, I'm starting to see some investors go back for straight equity again. Sure. because What, what are you saying? Yeah, because convertible notes, I think lots of investors have gotten burned because lots of new investors, they fully don't understand the mechanisms of of convertible notes and how they ultimately convert into the equity round. So a lot of times, uh, I think they they do back of the envelope math and investor and they think, oh, I have about ten percent of the company. Yeah. But when the actual conversion takes place, all you know, very complicated Excel uh, sheets of calculations and the and the new investor coming in at different valuations and they which find, dilutes them, of course. Yeah, right? which yeah. dilutes them, right? So mm -hmm. they don't remember that. Oh, I might get ten percent of the company right before the investor comes in, and then. Then I'm diluted down to a very small amount. So they they just ha they just like the security of I have this certain percentage of the company, um, and then uh, what they like is they they want to negotiate for these rights of it's called rights of first refusal. So that if you ever do raise uh, additional funding, the investor will get diluted, but he has the right to invest uh, more money at the same valuation as you're presenting to the public to maintain their percentage. So that's one of the important things. Investors are just like, oh, if I have 10% of the company and the company's doing really well, I don't want some bigger investor coming in and just diluting me down. I at least have a right 
to put in more money to maintain my 10%. So they're not looking for at a preferred rate. They're looking for just at the rate it goes to market. At the rate it goes to market, but but I want to be able to maintain it. Because the other investors, ultimately, they they would like the additional investors to, to kind of just get dwindled down. Yeah. If they really like a company, they'll they'll want all of the round, right? And yeah. so, um, so you, I guess the founder should be aware that in, that these investors, even amongst themselves, they're kind of competing for for you know to give themselves optionality. If you're in case your company does very well, they want to either invest more. But some investors may, you know, a lot of accelerators they they do these things where they want a locked in percentage. Of, of the company before the seed round. But if, if anything changes, they want you to maintain their percentage for free. So you have to be, you have to look at that language very carefully. Is it? So it doesn't dilute at all. It doesn't dilute at all, but then they don't even have to pay for the additional shares to keep them at a certain level. Yeah. So that kind of language has to be very carefully reviewed. So you're aware that, oh, I didn't give away. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Potentially, yes. Yeah, so much value you're giving to your initial investor to maintain their percentage without even paying for it. So yeah. you just got to make sure what that's clear. That, that may be discussed in an informal term sheet, but when the actual documentation comes, you got to you got to make sure, you know, there's so many time bombs in there. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, founders don't like to read through that. You need an attorney to kind of parse that through, highlight those things and double check with you like this is what you're giving away. So the investment is so much more than just I'm getting $5 million, I'm giving away 20%. There's a whole host of other issues that are there to, that that investor and, wants to be. And about. I want to add to this: is I don't care who you are, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care what stage of startup you are at, I don't care whether you're negotiating with your mom, your dad, an angel investor, or a venture capitalist. You have to, have to, have to get legal advice on the documents that you're about to sign. There is nothing. I mean, nothing more important that you will do at this stage than to make sure you're secure. Because a lot of the time, it's not just you, it's also the investor. We all have great intentions at the start. Hell, when we all get married, we have great intentions at the start. But we see how that goes a lot of the time. So make sure every single thing is actually written down and has been approved by an attorney who's working for you. Hey, got another question for you, Daniel. What about, so from the startup's perspective, equity or convertible note are safe. Like, firstly, what's the difference? Can we talk a little bit sure, about sure, the different type of documents that that startups should go for? Yeah. And I don't think there's a clear, this one's the very best, but maybe talk about some of the advantages of each one and the options that the startups have. Sure. So as a, as a company founder, you would obviously like um, to raise investment with and giving uh, the least amount of control to your investors. So that's why... Uh, Safes and convertible notes are a good alternative because they can be done relatively quickly in terms of the costs of of setting these documents up. But at the same time, those typical market standard convertible note notes and safes don't come with um, lots of control provisions. Okay, so they're just simple, easy documents. I think was a convertible note put together by Y Combinator first. Was it they who uh, who launched them? Oh, uh, actually, Y Combinator put together the safe. Okay, and that was very pro uh, founder because uh, you know for, for convertible notes uh, there's an upside, but the downside of convertible notes is that there's an interest rate that you have to pay the the investor that over time they get they get more money from because you. it's debt, right? It's debt, it's not equity, and that's the difference for everybody here listening. Equity is pure equity. Somebody comes in like buying a house, you own forty percent of that house or fifty percent of that house, maybe if you bought it with someone else. But convertible note or safes are debt. Uh, convertible notes are, are, are debt. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, convertible notes are debt. So you pay interest on it, and if you ever, if you're unable to ever convert that note or pay it back, the note holder, the investor, has a right to get the the extract value um, from your company for that. Say, I gave you a hundred thousand dollars in convertible debt. Uh, we were hoping that it would you would ha- raise financing and it would convert, but after two years. The, the note matures and you haven't done that, you owe me $100,000. You don't have it. Oh, by the way, I'll take your IP. Oh, by the way, I'll take this. So that's why uh, why Combinator came up with safes to kind of, they're, they're pro founder. So we they want to create an instrument that acted like debt, like this convertible note, but actually wasn't debt. So they took away the interest rate. They took away the maturity so that even if you owed this 
uh, investor money and it never converted into straight equity. It 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 lives in this sort of in between world where it's not pure equity, it's not pure debt, but you as a company do not have to pay that back unless there was some liquidation. So then, obviously, investors don't like that because you know their 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 investment could be sort of locked in no man's land because they didn't think about what happens in the situation where where the safe um, doesn't get converted into equity after two years. Where should it be? Sometimes you can negotiate. If it doesn't convert uh, after two years, maybe then it converts um, at a at a more favorable valuation for the investors, just so that they could see some closure. But for the for the company, you just don't want any convertible note or any safe to all of a sudden put you in a cash crunch. No, where someone comes in and says, "Oh, by the way, you spent that hundred thousand dollars on all these developers. Two years later, I want it back, and then you just don't have any cash." And then that that investor, if he's you know persistent or he's is a pain in the butt, he can potentially you know shut down your company. Listen, I had a case of a friend of mine who knew a couple of guys who were working with an investor. The investor gave them money. They then took that money, put it into a, uh, I won't even say the type of business so nobody knows, but a certain type of business which is very, very, very lucrative. They then turned this business into a top-class business and built into the contract was a provision that said that they had to pay $100, just $100 by the end of year two. And they didn't pay the $100 because they didn't realize it was there and it was hidden in a place. And he took the company from them and escorted them out of the office at the, end, at the day after it was supposed to be paid. And they had zero ownership in the company. Wow. Zero ownership of the company. The company was worth at that stage about $15, $20 million. So he invested the money into it, put it into these guys. They built it. They created it. They had everything in place. It was worth a huge amount of money. And there was a tiny provision in there whereby it was debt that needed to be paid back, but it wouldn't even look like a convertible note. So again, it brings me back to that same place. Be so careful, entrepreneurs. This is not your world. And then, so, okay, so we know what safe is. We know why investors would not want to sign a safe, right? But we know why entrepreneurs would want to sign it. We know why investors would be pretty happy to sign a convertible note, but they're going to add in a bunch of provisions to try and make sure that they prepare, they, um, sorry, uh, they preserve their liquidity or preserve the percentages that they have in the business. Where does equity fit in? Like, why would an investor or a startup choose equity over a safe or a convertible note? Yeah, so um, the equity portion of it, it gets complicated because because you're you're now going to discuss valuation, and you're going it's 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 it feels much more like a a commitment so that the investor now is, you know I guess the, the market terms are they they look to a Series A deal the, the terms and the the number of documents they kind of like shrink it down to a a Series C equity deal yeah. but there's still a lot of complicated. Uh, terms and things to negotiate and discuss, and then th- that's time consuming. That's also requires the founders to understand exactly what's going on in this equity deal. So a lot of times it it takes a lot of thought and and time to kind of understand these concepts. And so a lot lots of times both companies just don't like to get into it, but it's expensive. So then they try to punt punt that decision till they get a much bigger round, but. Um, lots of investors will want that equity just just for the comfort of saying, let's set a valuation. I want 10%. Yeah. I want it here. I they want... can still be diluted, right? They can still be diluted, yeah. And they'll, then they may negotiate you know, those terms of how to address the dilution, right? So they, they may address the dilution if you're an investor by saying, I get a veto right or approval of who, who comes in and at what valuation, right? So, so I kind of control how much I get diluted or I want rights to either invest more money to maintain my percentage or invest more money at a discount. So you have to yeah. be aware as a founder, like what, what those terms are and yeah. how they're worded and, and, or no, I just get to maintain my percentage without any money. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I mean, there are well-known uh, accelerators with great reputations with amongst founders. When you get a letter from that accelerator, you're just like, I'm signing. I don't even, you know, put me down. I'm so excited, right? I won't even name who they are, but even they have terms that are very. I think. I think. It, I think founders should be aware because they have terms where they maintain their percentage without you, you giving any more money. And you got to be careful because there are investors who will not come in on subsequent rounds 
because they see uh, 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 percentages which do not dilute under the previous rounds. Yeah, and they say they'll 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 hold you as a founder responsible because of how did you make this deal with this early early investor? You gave away a lot of value. Yeah, yeah. And now we're coming in. We're we're we're, we're well, we're basically giving that value away too. So that that makes you you less attractive. So if you got to be aware of the terms you're giving away to your investors. Right. And if you're if you're a founder today and you got an early stage company and you're raising say 1.5 on a 4.5 or a 5 million valuation, whether we call it a a 5 million cap in an invertible note or whether we call it a valuation in an equity deal or whether it's a save for you're protected in other areas, what's your preference? My preference is uh, if it's if if it's a single investor, one point five million, probably do uh, um, an equity round. Go go for an equity round straight away. Why why would you do that? If 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 it's a first time investor, because uh, that that gives them the most comfort, and it is a significant amount of money that the cost of doing that deal isn't you know co- it isn't as cost prohibitive. Gotcha. If you're raising a smaller amount, like three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand dollars, and you want to do a full blown equity convertible deal. note, right? Yeah, convertible note yeah. saves and things yeah. like that. Yeah, I will say that now, um, the C deals, convertible note rounds, are probably getting a little bit larger because you know the, they, you know, investors are looking at C Series C deals that are uh, much higher than you know years before would be like a million dollar C deal. Now they're kind of looking at a $3 million seed deal. Yeah, and we listen, we just had one where it started off and we were sure it was going to be a convertible note and then one of the later investors came in and said, no, we want to go for straight equity and then everybody else moved to equity. So question for you, how expensive is it to do for all of the legal work and preparation work for an equity round versus a convertible note? And I'm just talking about in general. In general. If, if anyone was Yeah, in general, it's probably, I would say, five times the cost. Oh my so, goodness! To, yeah, do, to do an a equity round? equity round, yeah, lots. It's also because an equity round, lots of the investors will want uh, to make sure they'll, they'll want to do more in depth due diligence about the company. Yeah, and that's when they find out like, oh, this wasn't done right. This, th- there's a lot of like corporate cleanup. So if you didn't have an attorney help you uh, set up the company, there's there's lots of little things that the investor wants cleaned up. So a lot of times. Uh, when, when investors come in with a safe or convertible note, they kind of come in knowing that warts and all, I'm not going to take a, a, a deep dive. Uh, I'll just accept that wherever you are, and I'll depend on that that first equity round investor that comes in later to kind of clean everything up. You're right, and, and so tr- we're just really kicking the can down the road yeah. a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so- wow, great stuff. So, okay, now let's move on to when the startups come in. Obviously, they want all this great legal advice, which is which is absolutely vital, but they also want access to the investors. How does the relationship work between the attorneys, especially the huge attorneys like yourself, and the institutional investors, and that introduction process look like with startups. Again, I know it's not part of the job process, but we see it every day. Right? Yeah. So um, obviously, I, I I get to know my uh, my clients and their their business models. And you know, as as attorneys, you're, especially st- startup venture capital attorneys in L.A. or Silicon Valley, you're in the flow of commerce and information. So obviously. We also represent venture capital investors, right? And they love seeing deals, seeing ideas, and see, meeting founders. So, if if you're a company uh, that that is you know is ready to sort of be um, be looked at by by an investor, I'm happy to introduce my uh, my clients to investors that I know. And sometimes that does not lead to a direct investment, but it's an initial meeting where you go to them and you don't go to them and say, I need money. You actually go to them and just ask for advice. And that's very valuable. And then if they really like you, they may want to invest in you or they they may see your type of business and they may know other investors that may be interested in you. So they'll 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 reintroduce you to their network if they like you. So it's just a first step of saying, you know, I I I meet uh, I met I have a startup client that was you know based here in Santa Monica but doing a business overseas, right? And so they said, how do I get in contact with with uh, investors in uh, Europe or Middle East and Africa, right? And so uh, I have you know connections through my uh, investor clients to uh, different funds, and they they know okay, I know this fund has an African Middle East European office. 
let's put you guys two together. So at least there's some information so you can go to that investor, introduce yourself, tell them about your business, and let them help help you through 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 our mutual connections of introducing you to a, a wider pool. Ultimately, introduction is just an introduction. You, as a founder, still have to do the heavy lifting of impressing that um, those investor groups. But sometimes it's so hard as a founder just to even know the the neighborhood of of investors that are looking for your type of company. And that's where we as attorneys try to be a little bit of a matchmaker of getting you in the right ballpark so you're not wasting your time talking to a group of uh, investors that just isn't right for your type of business. It's even more than that and and you know it's it was so interesting. So I've been in business for so many years in so many places but it wasn't until I came to Los Angeles 5 6 years ago that I really really understood how this whole system works. Investors do not need to receive phone calls directly from founders. It's just that simple. Now, we have, as everybody knows, a small fund at Expert Dojo where we give out $50,000 checks. And I'm always getting approached by conferences to say, well, would you like to sponsor us? And would you like to have a booth? And I'm like, we don't need publicity for the fact that we have money. Like, if we have money, people will oh, come to us, right? <laughs> and it's exactly the same further up the food chain for the venture capitalists and the large angels. They have so much deal flow. The challenge is not trying to find deal flow. The challenge is being able to curate through the mountain of deal flow they're receiving to actually pick the ones that have the best chance of success. Sure. So that whole referral network isn't like most spaces where, yeah, 5 or 10% comes through the referral network. For me, 80% comes through the referral network. And if there is no chatter in the local area about a particular startup being really hot, the chances of an angel or a venture investor putting money in your business is substantially lower, if not zero. Is that fair? Sure, absolutely. I had a I had lunch with a VC last week, and he was telling me the honest truth. You know, he's a seed stage investor, but if he ever meets like a like a like a startup either from LA or Silicon Valley that that's gone through the rounds and and is perceived to be hot, but they come to him, he always asks the question, "Why are you?" in front of me, did everybody pass on you, right? If you're really hot, you shouldn't be talking to me. It's almost <laughs> so like the- How do you get past that? Yeah, then? What, yeah, because if you went through the rounds, if you're really quality, someone would have snatched you up. So the fact that you found me, because you know a, a seed stage deal, still reputable, but still maybe not the right fit, right? Because they, they, they invest in a certain type of startup. But you know it's important for founders to know exactly what the- um, each investor, what their sweet spot is and what they really invest in. Because if you go to an investor and just tell them you love them and everything, and they'll, they'll say, "What? didn't you go see these other five that, that really specifically invest in your um, your area? And if they all passed on you or you didn't meet them, then you're not doing your homework. But if you met all of them and they all passed on you, why do I get the privilege of investing in you? So you have to, it, it's, that game has to be played very carefully. Very carefully. And like as founders, once you start playing this game properly, it's 40 to 50% of your entire workday, if not more than that. And the way that you approach investors is so terribly important. Some of the best founders, when I hear them pitching in front of investors, they're talking about the fact that they don't desperately need money straight away, but they may need it in the future. And they're just making the investor know that it might be coming up, even if they need money next month. Yeah, right? yeah Because yeah. they want the investor, well, well, why don't you need money? I think this is a really good business. And look, Bird is such an interesting example here locally, right? Valuation last week of $2 billion now. Nothing to justify it except for FOMO. Yes. All of the investors don't want to be left out of a round that could turn into a multi-billion dollar company and then have their LPs. Because by the way, investors raise money, at least the institutional investors, they raise money from other people. Limited partners are putting that money in so that they can invest it in you, the startups. So by creating FOMO, by having enough amazing advisors, imagine having Daniel, myself, and 10 other people in the local ecosystem in Los Angeles all saying that your startup is really good and all calling the same angel investors and saying, I think this is a great fit for you because the startup is an entertainment startup. They have really good traction. They've got a great team. You're a great entertainment investor. I believe this would be good. Once you're getting this phone call from two, three people, then 
that startup has a huge success opportunity. Sure, they, they get you, you're you're get trying to get the investors attention even if you just give you a minute they're just giving each company a couple seconds their deal flow is that heavy yeah right? they, they're bombarded with emails and calls it's and they need to see one two three diff, different people putting those um you know those recommendations out there and then so they can connect the dots and go oh this is the fourth time it's just they're humans they 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 hear it the the fourth time and they'll they'll take a deep look at least give you a perhaps a coffee meeting and by the way no never means no we had one of our companies, I can't say who it is because of the VC story I'm just about to tell you, but this particular person had pitched to 200 angels and VCs, 200 over 11.5 month period. She is a brick wall. Never mind about breaking through brick walls, she's a brick wall. <laughs> she never let it get to her, right? Yeah. And then she had one amazing investor who came in and said, I think you're a phenomenal entrepreneur, I love your product, Slight problems with defensibility, but you're such a great entrepreneur, you're going to break through. The second that this particular angel put money into the company, that angel then called four or five of her friends, and then suddenly her friends came in within two days. Now, the really interesting thing was the round went from being not filled after 11.5 months to within three to four days having it at $1.6 million. Oversubscribed. Oversubscribed within three, four days. Then a phone call comes in from one of the VCs that we had tried to refer over four months beforehand and they wouldn't even see them. And they begged to be allowed to lead the deal. Begged. Begged. Right? I believe it. I see. What's that. the difference between the company today and the company before? No difference. FOMO. FOMO. And a compelling event, Isn't, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the compelling event was a major investor in the local space put her hand up and said, I believe in this company. Yep. So you combine those two things together and people come back in. So never burn your bridges. I see this with entrepreneurs all the time. And I'm going to say we, because I'll be an entrepreneur for my whole life. We, we speak to some institutional investor. They piss us off because they say something that we think it's rude, it's arrogant, it's egotistical, or it's just not nice, right? And then we never want to deal with that person again. And what we don't understand is that this is exactly what you said at the start. It's a roadmap. And it is a roadmap to getting investment. And that roadmap is not a straight line. That roadmap is full of jagged edges, which means you're going to see an investor, they're going to say the wrong thing, you're going to go further, and then things change. And then in two, three, four months in the future, maybe their criteria changes, maybe they raise a different round, maybe some FOMO comes in, maybe one of their friends invests that they always invest alongside. Mm -hmm. Now, if they feel that you're a jerk, they're not going to invest in you just because of the experience they had before. But if it's just you who feels that they were a jerk, now you're in negotiation power when you get to a place that they want to come back and negotiate with you. Absolutely. Just yeah. be careful with your investors, okay? Treat them all like gold all of the way through. Our egos are not that small, right? We're fine. We can take a couple of rejections and more and more and more, but we just got to learn from them. Uh, okay, so I've got a few more things for you. Sure. Firstly, good books on either entrepreneurship or startup or in the space that you feel entrepreneurs should read? Wow. You know, it, uh, you know years ago, you know, uh, Brad Feld is a, a, a VC out in Colorado. He, back then, before he's written a couple books on, on startup investing. Yeah, he's a they, great guy. Uh, he, he wrote, you know, he wrote this blog about uh, VC term sheets, and then that started. He, he's very transparent because he's a VC that... that, that he's like the Gary Vaynerchuk of VCs, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just being transparent, just telling uh, uh, founders what, what, the, what the hidden doors and traps and things yeah. like that. So he, he wrote a book on convertible notes and I think probably um, equity financings and things like that. Though, uh, Brad Feld, his books are, are good. I would say now, given the, the, the age of Twitter, there are early stage VCs um, that you should follow because they give a lot of advice. Great their point. Posts. Great point. And, and not even Twitter, like Medium and Quora. Medium, they're yeah. in there all the time, right? Yeah, those, th those are just condensed. So don't even have to wait for a book. Beautiful. You can follow them on Medium, on Twitter, and really get their thoughts, like deep analysis of a certain you know segment, like software as a service. They have 
you know, and the way and their ana- analytical ability to break down a company and then look at what you need in terms of gross margin or, or, or the cost of acquiring companies. You have to learn that the language that they use to evaluate, right? So you'll yeah. you'll find some C stage VCs that write up a whole, you know, medium post on why they invested in a certain company. And you just see their thought process and then you can see do, is my company do I do I even present these analytics in my pitch or can I capably talk about them so that it makes the investor you know comfortable and makes it easier for them to invest in me because they know these are the metrics that drive success yeah I absolutely love it it's a huge point because I I love books and I would love to spend all day reading books but I just don't finish until 10 o'clock at night yeah, sure and I get up at 4:35 in the morning and I'm in I'm, I'm just embroiled in everything I'm doing on startup minute by minute but every single one of us has got time to read a three and a half to four minute post on Quora every single day by our favorite startups you know another thing I like right now is the hustle I don't know if you ever see it. It's out of San Francisco. It's just a small blog that comes out every single day, and it just tells us what's happening in the space. Oh, really? Uh, I've just uh, just saw it recently. It looks uh, really good. Uh, okay, so let's move to entrepreneurs you like. Pick me one or two. Some of your favorites. People oh. that you've seen who, they don't have to have been successful. It could be someone that you know that just demonstrate really strong traits. Sure. Um you mean uh, com- companies like uh, you know? I'm always gonna highlight. No, you can't say Elon Musk. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, you can't say Elon Musk. Uh, let's see, let me see. Well, I, I, I will, I will give a shout out um, to to one of my uh, former clients. Lovely. Yeah, uh, his name is Howard. Uh, I'll just say his name is Howard. I, you know, I won't, I won't, uh, em- you know, embarrass him uh, too much. But he was an entrepreneur. Um, which is unlike it, I would say this he's he's in the sweet spot of entrepreneurs because he was actually older. He was uh over the age of forty when yeah. he uh did his venture. And so that that goes against the grain of people thinking that oh all these hot startup people are from, you know, just out of college. I love this. Yeah. He's over forty. Um he had worked in a lot of different startups. Uh, with a reputable accelerator, so he's, you know, he was in the background doing different things. But because he was part of this ecosystem, he was able to meet a couple of really great developers, and he can identify the talent. So when he started his company, he was able to identify the team that he needed to to to, to start with, right? Especially the technical lead. That's very hard to to find in LA. If you're just a person with an idea, try finding. A technical co-founder, high-level CTO level person that's willing to give up their day job to work with you. Phenomenal point. I right. love that. So he he came in late. He brought a life of experience with him. He made sure it was really relevant for what he was trying to do, and then picked the great people that he had built up over the years. Yeah, and then he, and the, because of that, he did not have to raise a lot of initial capital. Yeah. just just a little bit. But the other thing what I found that that are great entrepreneurs is that. Great entrepreneurs actually aren't overly, you know, the the, the classic uh, entrepreneurs like I'm a big risk taker, right? No, actually, a lot of the great entrepreneurs, it's their ability to see an opportunity that uh, that usually comes from their background and experience. So they, if they create a software as a service company, they're not creating a generic one out of the blue in an area that they don't know about. It's an area that they either have studied or worked in and they see something that all the other people don't see. So they create a company to attack that that certain opportunity. Yeah. And I, they attack it hard. Oh my, I love that. And it's not I mean because you're right. Everybody focuses on the risk taters and say, yeah, if you do no. The job as a CEO or founder of a company, an early stage company, you have two things to do. Create a roadmap so your vision and your strategy can be laid out in alignment to get forward to a place that you know you're going to get to. And number two, make sure that your company does not die today. Yeah. Right? How how, how do I find <laughs> you know, compar- you know, competitive advantages to separate me from the t- t- thousands of other people that are trying to do something similar or trendy to kind of separate myself from that and, 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 and find good people and a roadmap, like you said, but then, um, and just create a, 
he created a software as a service company that if I told you exactly, I mean, some of this is confidential that he he won't be able to talk about for probably another six months. But he, yeah, he exited a company, um, uh, software as a service, at, at, at an amazing multiple. So in about four years, he went from zero to about twenty five million. Beautiful. So that's like- the key. So by the way, that's the key. They're the entrepreneurs I respect, not the ones who raise billions of dollars of uh, venture capital money, get exploited and manipulated all the way through, probably get fired from their own company, and they're nothing more than a CPA's rounding off number. I'm talking about the great entrepreneurs who start real businesses and exit for twenty five, fifty million dollars. They do it in a short period of time. They build strong teams and everybody makes money. Man, I cannot think of a better way to finish. Hey, by the way, this is a very special Special day in the fridge today because it's the first day we've brought in a portable, a portable fan, right? Which is special. Sure. Normally by this time you would be dying. <laughs> Vincent, our producer, went out and brought a fan in. We've just taken the fridge to a whole new level. Did you right. feel like privileged? Yeah, I thought that. And this fridge is, it's so, you know, it's technically, you know, pretty. It, it, it's easy on the eyes, and I thought it might, you know, even answer some of our questions. Right? Is like, this like the a... best fridge you've ever had a podcast in? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank Daniel, you. thank you for joining us. Fo- big shout out to Fox Rothschild, a phenomenal attorney firm. We got a lot of re- love and respect for them here in the LA area. Uh, you guys should check them out. Daniel, for people to contact you, how can they do that? Sure. My email address, my name is uh, Dan Wu, so it's just D W U at Fox Rothschild. And that's F O X R O T H S C H I L D dot com. Beautiful. Thanks for joining us, my friend. I hope you've all got lots of phenomenal information about how to approach investors, but more importantly, how to protect yourself against investors. We will be back at the Art of Startup War next week, same time, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. If you know any other entrepreneur equally ambitious as you, then share this podcast by paying it forward to other entrepreneurs who are building your own army. Now, as always, our website, expertdojo.com, is packed with information to help you grow your business, find investment, and train for victory. We also walk our talk and invest in startups every year in our accelerator here in Silicon Beach. You can always reach out to me at brian at expertdojo.com and I look forward to being back here again at our regular time next Tuesday, 10 a.m. with another of the world's top investors helping you win the war against startup failure.